And what would be your advice to up and coming moms who haven't really studied nutrition and don't know what to feed their kids? Rainbow of plants on that plate at every meal. Just a bright, beautiful rainbow of fruits and vegetables and beans, and to keep doing it. There's some research that shows that kids need 10 exposures to a new food to go from, ew, gross, to eating it and liking it. My kid never read those studies. I think 10 would have been the low end of the number of times I had to just keep trying, but when we provide that variety of brightly colored whole plant foods and we model eating and enjoying it ourselves, they are watching. So if she's still in the, ew, gross, not touching it phase, and I don't make a big deal of that, I just say, mm, well, I think it's really delicious. Here's a little dipping sauce for it. You know, modeling that enjoyment and love of these delicious, wonderful foods. Those kids are gonna come along, but we have to be consistent. Don't give up the first time your kid tells you, I don't like cauliflower. Be like, meh, and keep that cauliflower on the menu going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because their taste buds are more sensitive than adults. And so they are way more picky when it comes to vegetables. Yeah, and I, I see so many parents just really give up too early and to put, I would guess, I guess I'd say we can, of course, we're concerned about our kids. We want them to have a healthy, balanced diet that is good for their body and good for their brain. And unfortunately, what that can mean is that we're paying way too much attention to what the kid is eating and creating that sense of stress around it. You're not eating your cauliflower. You need to eat the cauliflower. Why don't you eat the cauliflower? You'll never eat the cauliflower. That just creates a whole drama around the cauliflower. So we can just step back from that. We can just keep presenting the cauliflower, no big deal. We keep enjoying the cauliflower ourselves, no big deal. We go, ooh, maybe you'll like it this time. I have a little cheese sauce I put on it. You know, give it a try with that positive, upbeat kind of vibe. And uh, it takes a lot of the pressure off and helps create a much healthier relationship with food for that kid going forward when there's more space and ease around it. Mm -hmm. As a nutritionist, what is your current diet like? We're going back onto a vegetarian keto diet this week at my house. We do a lot of keto cycling. So um, we'll spend a few weeks or a few months, uh, no, not usually a few months, probably up to a month on a, on a vegetarian keto diet. And we do the, we use the testing strips and we do all the tracking. It's uh, definitely a little bit time consuming, but we feel really good on that approach. Um, and then I love a cookie and I'm not signing up to never have a cookie again. <laughs> so then we'll typically, uh, you know, take a week or so off and enjoy the pasta, enjoy the cookies. Um, and even some of the things like the butternut squash that volunteered itself in our garden and we've got squash coming out of our ears. So, you know, we'll take that time off that more regimented sort of diet, enjoy all those goodies. And then, um, often right now, choosing to go back onto it. So today will be day one back on that, which means what do I eat? So it means breakfast might be a gorgeous big bowl of radicchio, again, growing that in our garden. So a big bowl of radicchio and arugula with maybe some um, fried eggs and possibly some uh, grilled halloumi cheese on the side. I wanna make sure I get enough protein first thing in the morning, that's one of the probably the biggest changes I, I encourage people to make. Most of us are not getting that 25-ish grams of protein that we need at the beginning of the day in order to set our hormone balance for the entire rest of the day. So I pay a lot of attention to that right off. So I'm gonna have that big bowl of greens and eggs, maybe some grilled halloumi, maybe a scoop of my sauerkraut on top of it. Um, oh, so good. And then at lunch, we might have like a zucchini alfredo making a, a keto alfredo sauce that's just so creamy and luscious on those little zucchini noodles and typically i only eat twice a day so probably wouldn't have much for dinner if anything yeah 
and I skip breakfast and I eat from 12 to seven or eight and that's my window. So I'm intermittent fasting for 16 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I try to fast one day out of the month, like the first day of the month, just to, uh, yeah, just to recycle all the dead proteins and cells inside my body mm -hmm. and try to activate autophagy. Uh, I was wondering if you do any fasting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I'm like you probably on around a 16 to 18 hour fasting window per day. And then I do day long fast meh, occasionally. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I think as a society, we've kind of forgotten to eat only when we're hungry because we're kind of blessed to have food everywhere and snacks everywhere. So we're just constantly eating, which isn't great for our health. And it doesn't allow our bodies to recycle those dead cells in our body, and uh, which, is, which is a key component of the anti-aging process. Oh, certainly, certainly. And that comes back to those cues too. We're all very well trained, uh, and we have our cues in place for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that goes, you know, from the time we're in school, until we're in our cubicles, right? We have those set societal times that tell us it's time to eat, regardless of where we're at or would be at if we were in touch with those um, physiological cues. And some of us don't have as much leeway to really choose to eat where we're, when we're hungry or not, but maybe we all have some leeway to check in with ourselves and say, ah, you know, am I really hungry right now? Do I need to eat? If so, how much? I know talking about the time restricted feeding and then maybe dropping down to only eating those couple times a day. Uh, whilst the research very slightly nudges out that it's probably a little bit better for us to front load our food intake earlier in the day. So more like a breakfast and lunch kind of scenario versus a lunch and dinner kind of scenario. The, the difference is pretty small. And I definitely find working with people who are like human and have like, families and like lives you know for so many people um, that evening time is when they're going to see their friends it's when they're going to have that meal with their family and just to get that nana small little metabolic benefit of if they skip to dinner um, it's not worth it and 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 that's where we have to like we look at the science we review the evidence that's out there some things maybe are so bad like smoking cigarettes there's just not a real way to make an argument that's not that bad i can go ahead and keep doing it but for something like this if you're thinking about going to a more restricted eating window meh if it works for you it's maybe a little bit better to do it earlier in the day to do the eating earlier in the day and if it doesn't work for you no big deal then have your window be later in the day and um and work with that mm -hmm. so 